Now last Sunday, instead of making a hook here at Black Bear Forge, we talked about quality of work and that was mostly because I was suffering from a sore back and I didn't think getting into the shop and working at the anvil was the best thing for me to do at that point. But this week we are back with a hook of the week. We missed Wednesday's video. I thought I was going to get it out a little bit late and that was going to be a video discussing the hammerheads that we've been working on and one of them has been hardened and tempered and the other one I've done some forging still need to finish cleaning up the eye and we have all that on video but I haven't completed that video so it's probably going to be this coming Wednesday's video a few days from now but instead of doing that for today on Sunday since a lot of people like to see the hook videos on Sunday and I had some people that truly seem to be disappointed that we didn't do one last Sunday. Today we're going to do a hook. And for today's hook, I'm going to start with a piece of 3 8 square bar. That's about 10 millimeter square bar. This is 33 inches long, which is 84 centimeters. And I know some of you don't like centimeters, even though you're in the metric system, you got to have millimeters because centimeters confuse you. So that's 840 millimeters. And that's uh, just what I found out on the pile. I didn't cut this. I didn't worry about it. It's just what happened to be there. And I have a second piece that is 270 millimeters or about 10 and a half inches long. Again, it was just what happened to be laying out there. Nothing special unless you're trying to make the same thing over and over again. It's okay to experiment with random sizes and see what happens. So what am I going to do with this material? Well, somebody suggested a plant hanging hook, and this is a style that I've made quite a bit. So I'm going to make the kind of hook that I usually do. And it's kind of a shepherd's hook thing that will curve out away from the wall. It's made to mount on the wall, not one that sticks in the ground. And the plant will hang over here somewhere. But then to stabilize it and give it another point of attachment, I like to make a little T-bracket. Of course, this assumes you've got something solid to mount it to. If you're just mounting it to a single post, that doesn't work very well. But that'll go on. We'll do a half lap joint for that. We'll make a matching finials on the ends of this and one end of that. Fairly straightforward hook on this end. Nothing too unusual or difficult. But it's still an interesting hook, and if you've got a nice wood wall on a barn or a house or your porch or whatever, it's a good hook to hang plants on. But before we get started on that, I've got a couple of things that came in the mail and I thought I would share with you. Last week we saw the drill bits from Drill America and the guillotine tool that Cloverdale Forge sent. And we're going to do a video just on assembling it and looking at how that works. And today, Jerry has sent a box, and this one I knew was coming. Jerry was going to send this a little bit earlier, but apparently he's had some uh, health issues. So Jerry, I hope you're feeling better, and I hope you didn't uh, sacrifice yourself any to get this out, because you got to take care of yourself first. So this has a note. It says, John, it says, hello, John. I just got out of the hospital. They want to replace both of my shoulders. Yuck. But I'm not so sure about it yet. In any case, here's the promised blade fullering standard guillotine. I included a copy of the description I use on eBay and Etsy. So this is apparently available for sale on eBay and Etsy. The idea behind the tool is to provide a way of guiding your blade while you forge fullers. It is adjustable so that you can forge the fuller in the middle of the blade or along one edge. So it goes on a little bit to talk about that and has the description that he includes when he does these for sale. Now, I don't do a lot of blades, but to give this a fair trial, we might have to use a blade. Boy, it's a heavy thing. Good thing my back's feeling better. So here's the, the tool. It's got adjustable stops here so you can center a, a blade. The bottom die is removable, it looks like. Hard to do this one-handed. I'm holding a little, little GoPro to take a close look at this, just a different way of approaching the the close-ups on the, the bench shot here. And there's a bigger die in here, so you can mix and match. And of course, he then he then sent out a couple of other dies that we can use in this. And the top looks like it's adjustable, so I'm gonna to have to adjust that for the bigger, bigger die it's set up right now for this. That's really a pretty slick design. I'm 
I'm pretty impressed with that for doing these lengthwise fullers. And even though I don't do a lot of blades, if I decide to do a big blade, this would come in handy, but I think there are other things that this would be useful for. For instance, fullering a draw knife is one of those things you need to put long fullers in sometimes on one side. So I'd have to make a flat plate that goes in this, but I think that'd be really easy to do and that might be a great tool for fullering a draw knife. In any case, thank you Jerry. I'm going to give this a trial and I will put a link to Jerry's website or Etsy shop down in the video description if you're looking for something like this and you can go take a look at what he has to offer. Now the other thing that came in the mail just the other day is a box from YouTube. Now that's pretty special. I know what's in this. I had to fill out a form and ask them to send it but they send it free of charge once you do all the paperwork that verifies that you made your goal. And this is Really something kind of special as far as I'm concerned. I think I mentioned when we hit 100,000 subscribers that this stuff doesn't really mean anything in the long run. It's just like getting a bowling trophy. It doesn't make you a better bowler. It just says you were good once. I haven't bowled in years. So this comes with a letter that says you have done something very few YouTube creators accomplish. You had an outstanding 100,000 people subscribe to your channel. We know the numbers on YouTube can get really big, but we hope that you don't lose sight of the reality behind that six-digit milestone. Each and every person who has subscribed to your channel has been touched by what you created. You know, and that's kind of the way I feel about it. That's why this is so special to me. It's really about sharing the craft and the tradition of blacksmithing with people who want to learn more about blacksmithing. You achieved this milestone with hard work, perseverance, and probably a healthy sense of humor, too. Yeah, that helps. What you've accomplished can't be taken away from you, and we'd like to recognize you and your hard work with this Silver Creator Award, a small token of our esteem and respect. This is the YouTube Silver Creator Award. And I'm not going to touch it with my bare hands because I'll probably scratch it, although eventually it'll probably hang on the wall in the shop office. So it's nicely engraved. I'll be able to use this to see if I need to shave or not. So thanks everybody who subscribed, and let's head on to the next big milestone. But I have talked on long enough without actually lighting the forge. Let's go make a hook. I'm going to start just by doing a simple finial on the end, half face blows, and quickly switch to the peen. I want to knock those corners off. You could kind of round the end up first if you want to, but I don't think it matters too much how you approach it. One way or the other, what you want is a consistent finial for all three ends that get the finial. So we're going to look at this two more times. That means if you need to file or grind, take the time to file or grind. While I'm here, I'm going to lightly bevel the, the edges here just to take the new look off the bar. I'll just try and do that to one half the bar, then I'll set this aside and let it cool. And while it cools, we'll do the short bar. And since it has to be held in tongs anyways, we can do both ends of it. I do try to make sure it's straight. Okay, set that aside. So again, half face blows. And then go to the cross pane.
Do a little bit of straightening at a low heat, but don't get carried away. Now turn it around, do the same to the other end. And then this piece will need to cool. And then we'll lay it out for where we want the half lap joint after it's cooled. So the next thing I want to do is just draw out the end of this nice simple hook on this one I think like so many things what you do at this stage is just up to what you want for your project Then think about your finial and how the hook relates to that finial. Now to start with, I want my hook on the opposite side of where that finial would show. So it goes to the back, but that means my curl is going to the front. Hope that makes sense. So my curl is coming that way and that's the front where my little pad is. And that way when I bend this it's a little bit too long a heat. If I had quenched that and cooled this off that wouldn't be as big a deal but it's not hard to straighten. So now the hook is on this side and my pad is on the other side. And this will all correct in the end and it'll all be on the same side. But for now, that's what I want. And I'm going to straighten that a little bit more to make it look better. It's not too hard to do like that. And before we do anything else, I think I'll go ahead and run my chamfer all the way up the bar. So that's completely done. I think I'm happy with that hook now. So I'll just run that chamfer up to where we stop from the other end. And the next thing we need to do is lay out for our half lap joint, but we need to know how far this hook is going to roll over this way. So I'm going to let it cool, we'll figure that out, and then we'll know where our joint needs to go. I keep a whole bunch of cutoffs of various diameters, tubing, pipe, whatever, and these are real handy for shaping something like this. It just makes a quick and easy jig. So I'm going to just mark about 180 degrees off here just by eye, and I know that I'm going to want my hook about there on the finished piece, and I'm just going to roll this around here until I get to my other mark. And I'm going to put a mark there. So this is how much material is going to be taken up in bending the arch on the shepherd's hook part of this. So I can't have this bar up in here or be on the curve somewhere. So this has to be somewhere down in here. So if I just bring it down an inch or so, that'll be fine. And that actually makes this a lot shorter. This looks really long, but by the time it's done, this isn't so bad. And in use, this is my 
my pad that'll mount on the wall and then this will mount on the wall it seems better to me to have this overlap and that way it's pinning this against the wall since it's riveted it probably doesn't matter that much but we're going to go ahead and put that over the top so we definitely want it on this side and we'll put a mark there so we can line this up when it's hot this piece we just want it centered so that's relatively easy this is nine and a half inches so four and three quarters should be the center doesn't hurt to double check it from both ends make sure you did your math right now the center punch marks can both be on the top so you can see them this one won't show in the finished piece because we are going to put a rivet in So it is really just a, a lineup mark at this point. Now that's a job I would typically do under the treadle hammer so I can hold on to both the, the work piece and this. But I didn't have a camera over there, so we did it here. Otherwise it doesn't scoot around so much. Now people ask about both of these things quite regularly. The hook rule that's made out of an old square. I did a video on this a while back and I'll put a link up here in this corner to that video. But if you're just looking to buy one of these, I just relisted these on the Etsy shop. I bought a bunch of squares that I'll, I'll cut down so these will be available in the Etsy shop. And the silver pencils are now available again. I went ahead and ordered a couple of dozen of those. So if you're looking for either of those tools, that's where you can go find them. Now this half lap joint is something I would typically do under the treadle hammer or even under the power hammer for heavier material. But since not everybody has those tools, I know you like to see basic tools being used. So we're gonna do it right here at the anvil and it should be pretty quick and easy. This is small enough material. It's not a big deal one way or the other how you do it. And I'm going to hold the long bar down with a hold fast. And we'll probably start to set it with a hammer. I'm going to start with this big hammer, but then we'll clean it up and finish it with a flatter. If you don't have a flatter, just use the hammer or just use a flat bar. But be warned, if you've got a heavy flat bar that you're using and you're hammering on it cold, using it like a flatter, it's going to rattle you a little bit. Make sure your center punch mark is out there where you can find it. And make sure you're putting these on in the right relationship so that all the little finial ends are going to be up. Unfortunately, this one's cooling off much faster and I'm going to end up with my joint being real one-sided. So I'm going to stop for a second. I'm going to reheat that and I'll bring this bar out and let it cool just a little bit before I start over. So I'll set that aside where it can cool just a little bit while I get this other piece ready. It certainly wouldn't be the end of the world in a project like this, but on some pieces that symmetry can really make a difference. much better. This just kind of smooths it out. You want to get it all the way down to the face of the anvil. Then we just need to straighten things because now we've kind of bowed everything up in the air a little bit. But that's not bad. You can see how the half lap joint looks there and how it goes together. And that's real it's a real good looking joint once you get the rivet in there it looks real it looks harder than it is at that point and this bar is pretty straight I'm just going to let it cool a little bit I got too many tools out. I'm going to take some time and put some stuff away here. So 
So that can sit and cool, and then we'll do the hook. And don't mess up your half lap joint. So that looks pretty good. The other thing to do is probably put it in the vise and check to make sure these finial ends are not twisted one to the other. So a little bit of twist means it doesn't sit on the wall flat. Now it's time to bend this into that shepherd's hook shape. This is going to be a weak spot. If you get this hot, it's going to bend there and not anywhere else. So keep your heat out here until you absolutely have to heat this last little bit. And then you may want to put water on this to cool that so you don't mess that up. Actually, you know what? I'm going to drill this first because it's going to be really hard to get a drill in there afterwards. To do that, the first thing I want to do is get a nice centered hole in this piece that will be the outside. So I'll drill that and then I'll use that as a lineup mark for the other one. This still needs to cool a little bit so it'll take me a few minutes but you'll never know because I'll edit all that out. And then through that hole I will mark with a layout punch which is just a center punch exactly the same size as the drill. They come in sets just like your drills do. They don't generally make a very deep mark, so I usually come back with a center punch and make it a little easier to find. I figure you've seen me drill holes a lot before, so you didn't need to watch me drill the holes again. So that's going to look like that when we get it all assembled, and it'll be a flush rivet in the back. I just put that big piece of tube in the vise and I use a bending fork to clamp down the hook part here. So you just do that and you bend it. And if it needs to go a little bit more, you just advance it to where you can work with it so you don't have to try and go all the way around in a circle the first time. I don't have enough heat to bring this all the way down, so I'll heat just this little bit again. And that keeps this from getting too hot. So I just quench that joint part there so it doesn't bend. And that really does make that a lot easier. You will want to check it for twists this way and correct anything that you see there. And now we're going to let this cool and we'll assemble that joint. Now it pays to double check your, your piece here. If I put the rivet in that way, this is really crooked, so clearly it shouldn't be that way. But if I put the piece in like that, this comes out in the right plane. This rivet's a little long. I'm going to go ahead and set it down and then I'll just grind it flush in the back. Although it's uh, going to fill that countersink pretty well. Still needs a little grinding, but that guarantees us it's in pretty good shape. And we still ended up a little bit twisted, but that won't be hard to fix. I don't know if something slipped while we were riveting, possibly. So I just put that in the vise and used a twisting wrench to straighten that out. Just these few last minute tweaks. Then I'm going to bring it up to heat and I'm going to wax it. Somebody right now is saying, but you didn't put your touch mark on it. Frequently things like this, I don't bother to touch mark. But if you really want to see it, I'll put it on one of these arms. Doesn't really fit back in the forge, so most of that arm isn't real hot, but it should be enough for the last name part of the touch mark. It's going to be tough. Another reason not to worry about it sometimes is it just isn't convenient. Oh, it bounced. Yep, another good reason not to, not to mess with it. That is ugly. Now, if you really think you need to touch mark projects like this, it might be better to touch mark one of the components before you do the assembly. Just do it when you're through forging that part of that component. But really, 
not everything has to have a touch mark. That's sort of a modern thing. A lot of the old timers, you find simple pieces. They didn't bother to touch mark it. And a lot of times the touch mark you see on a piece wasn't the smith that made it. It belonged to the company he worked for or belonged to the master. So there might have been 10 people producing a product, but it was the master of the shop that got to put the touch mark on there. But anyways, it's got my name on there twice. So if somebody wants to buy this in the Etsy shop, you get a double touch mark. Makes up for one of those hooks I didn't put a touch mark on. It's a very nice looking piece on the, the side of the house. Again, the top screws in this need to be in something solid. If you don't have solid wood to mount this on, this isn't the right design of hook. If it's just going on a single stud, you just need a top and bottom because this isn't doing you very much good. But if you've got solid wood siding, a log house, a wood sided barn, even a block wall or something like that, this is going to be more solid because it's got three points of contact and it's not going to tip and rock and it's a little fancier plant hook that way. Like I say, this hook will end up on the Etsy shop. If somebody's looking for a hook like this, that's where it'll be. Along with the hook rulers and the silver pencils with the replacement leads, those are all listed on the Etsy shop again. And when we get the hammers done, we'll give one away, and the other one will end up on the Etsy shop. Eventually, I'm probably going to put everything that we make for the Hook of the Week series that doesn't get snatched up by somebody local or my wife on there. I've got piles of stuff I keep meaning to list on the Etsy shop, but I keep forgetting to do it or run out of time. But sooner or later, we'll get all that stuff listed. Thanks for the guillotine tool or the fullering tool, whatever you want to call it, that Jerry sent. I really appreciate that. And thanks to all of you subscribers and to YouTube for the 100,000 subscriber award. But that's all I've got for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. I will plan to be back on Wednesday to complete the video on the hammerheads. And then we're going to do the drawing for the 100,000 subscriber giveaway. So if you haven't entered, go over to that video that's the 100,000 subscriber giveaway announcement. And I'll link to that at the very end of this one somewhere. And make sure you follow the directions to enter that if you want to try and win the hammer. If not, you don't have to worry about it. I do hope you enjoyed the video. Give it a thumbs up if you did. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button down there. Feel free to stick around, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends. If you'd like to provide financial support for the videos here at Black Bear Forge, there are links in the video description for both PayPal and Patreon. Those are merely donations. The content is free. In the meantime, I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.